Ole Miss has an argument that it's big three sports, football, basketball, and baseball, are at the top of the SEC, potentially in the country. Seriously. This is the Locked On Ole Miss podcast. You are locked on Ole Miss. Your daily podcast on the Ole Miss Rebels. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. All right, welcome to the Locked On Ole Miss Podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Willis. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the official sports book of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started. And thank you very much for making the Locked On Ole Miss Podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Hey, Ole Miss might have the best football, men's basketball, and baseball coaches in the Southeastern Conference maybe the country when you take them in their totality. It is absolutely fantastic, the group that has been assembled. Coach Yo has done a phenomenal job, but for the sake of this argument, we're going to keep it at men's basketball, football, and baseball. You have a situation where you look around the coaches that come into the SEC and are coaching in the SEC. Nobody is doubting that Nick Saban is the GOAT. Everybody knows that. But whenever you put in Bohannon as the baseball coach, that brings the average down significantly. Nate Oates has not done yet what we expect him to do. He might be the number one seed in the NCAA tournament this year, but he has not done it yet. It's all potential. What's the old old coach's analogy on that one? Your potential is going to get me fired. It's all potential at this point. It could be really, really good, and it could move up to the next level, but it isn't there yet. And I expect that. You know, Brandon Miller, phenomenal basketball player. They're, they're a talented team and are going to go really far. But if you take away Lane Kiffin, and Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss and in his life has a ceiling that he has reached of the Sugar Bowl. That is the Access Bowl. That is the NY6. He has not made the playoff yet, but he has made it just to the cusp of it. And honestly, um, could have made the playoff that year. Has Ole Miss probably farther along than they have been since Johnny Vaught. That is where Lane Kiffin has right now. Now, people are going to point to the end of last season. Whatever. Um, 2022 is a new thing. He has a chance to turn it around. There is a new seriousness that has been detected around the football program with Lane Kiffin. Basketball, Chris Beard. People can say whatever they want to about him off the court, but on the court, his ceiling is he took Texas Tech, a traditional also ran in basketball, to the NCAA championship game and was a shot from defeating the Virginia Cavaliers. So his ceiling that he has reached at a less than blue blood program was the national title game. He also has an elite eight to his credit. So he has done really well. He had this Texas team that is going to go through this tournament as a dark horse to win the national championship. This is his team that he assembled. So we'll see how that goes as well. But Chris Beard, his ceiling, insanely high. And baseball-wise, nobody can doubt this. Uh, Mike Bianco, national champion winner, defending national champion winner. People are going to argue over, I guess, participation trophies that you have accumulated over the years, but... Whenever it comes to winning a title, that is always the tiebreaker. And whenever you try to argue different, it comes along, comes across less than less than what you think it is. I'll put it like that. Dave Van Horn, Jim Kelly, kind of similar at this point. Like I said, I, I I think he's an excellent baseball coach, but you you can't compare those two at the moment. It, Dave Van Horn wins one, that becomes an argument. It becomes a real argument. He better win one before Bianco wins two, though. So we'll see exactly how that goes. But that big three, and we say big three because traditionally that's what it has been inside the state of Mississippi. In reality, it's a big one or a big two, but we're going to stick with big three. 
Now, if we look around the Southeastern Conference, you have Josh Heupel, who went to an Orange Bowl this year. That's right on par with Lane Kiffin. You've got Rick Barnes, who has made it, I think, to an Elite Eight. But a really good basketball program has that program exactly where they want to be. And you have Tony Vitello, who last season had an unreal baseball team but got beaten in the Super Regionals. Tony Vitello does not have that title. Rick Barnes does not have a national championship appearance, to my knowledge. He might have with Kevin Durant, and I might be missing it. But if you look at those three, not really there. We talked about Alabama. We talked. Let's talk about Auburn. You have Hugh Freeze, who went to a Sugar Bowl with Ole Miss. I mean, it is what it is. Bruce Pearl, national championship game or Final Four. But the baseball coach isn't quite there. College World Series level, Butch Thompson got him to a College World Series. Not quite there. Used to, Florida was dominating this category whenever they were seemingly winning a national championship in football than basketball, you know, when they had Billy Donovan and then baseball, but they're not there now. Billy Napier, not there. Um, I think his name's Todd Golden, and basketball coach, not there. They're kind of rebuilding at the moment. Georgia has Kirby Smart, and then their other two programs are a little bit less than at the moment. South Carolina the same way. Mississippi State the same way. LSU, basketball program isn't quite there. Their their football program, Brian Kelly, is pretty elite. Their baseball program with Johnson, pretty elite. Basketball program, not quite there at the moment. So you see how this goes. Um, Texas A&M with Jimbo Fisher. Now, he's a national championship winning coach. Jim Sloshnagel, TCU and Texas A&M. Good baseball program. Buzz Williams, good basketball program as well. So those are really good examples of who would even be competitive with Ole Miss in this argument. It's, it's fantastic if you think about it. Think about what we went through. If you're my age and you went through Ole Miss sports in the 80s and the highlight of everything, you you know, Billy Brewer, Lee Hunt, and whoever was the baseball coach at that point. Billy Brewer and Ed Murphy, Jake Gibbs. You know, this is a sea change that is happening underneath our eyes. And Ole Miss has a chance to take the next step because they are willing to take the next step. So much of Ole Miss sports in the 80s and 90s was dictated by a small cabal of people that just wanted their access, that just wanted their feelings, that just wanted everything to benefit them. Now, like I said, with this almost heel turn that Ole Miss football Basketball and baseball is making with Lane Kiffin, Chris Beard, and to a lesser extent, Mike Bianco. Not really a heel turn, but national championship is going to make that hate worthy. Arkansas fans are all over my timeline at the moment talking about this Van Horn versus Bianco thing. But when you take into account all of that, Ole Miss sports in 2023 are light years ahead of what they were in 1989. And that was a good period for Ole Miss football. But in 1989, Ole Miss sports was infinitely behind where they are now. When we come back, we're going to talk about why, you know, Keith Carter is kind of the goat of ADs and is doing a phenomenal job all the way through. Seriously. But first, before we get started with that, I do want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the midway point of the NBA season, and now is the perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000, that's bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. All right, we realize in Mississippi you have to go to brick-and-mortar casinos. 
and that's the way the state law works in the state of Mississippi. But if you go to Tennessee, if you're visiting Memphis, Nashville, if you're going down to New Orleans and Louisiana, you would be able to download this app and use it as well. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores to threes drain, whatever you want to do. Plus, FanDuel lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with same game parlay. So don't miss out on your chance to get your no sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets when you go to fanduel.com slash locked on. That's fanduel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel. It's an official sports betting partner of the NBA. All right, thanks again for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. You know, check out the bracket breakdown challenge that's out there. You can go listen to the the college basketball bracket breakdown with national analysts and insights from our local experts. The Locked On College Basketball Bracket Breakdown has everything you need to make the most informed decisions on your bracket. Everybody loves a bracket. I mean, we're try- I'm trying to figure it out how I'm going to do it this year myself. Am I just going to do uniforms? Am I going to try and be super analytical? I don't know. I mean, the odds of win- getting a perfect bracket is like 9 trillion to 1. But anyway, find the episode on Locked On College Basketball wherever you get your podcast on, on YouTube. It's on the, um, it is on the podcast channel um, right now on ours. So you can check it out there. It's pretty cool. All right, so the first segment we talked about how Ole Miss has a chance to have, it may have the top th- top big three coaches in the Southeastern Conference, maybe nationally. And a lot of that is responsible for the energy that is around the program, but the person that put that together was Keith Carter. And Keith Carter has, in the last four years, positioned himself as almost a GOAT AD nationwide in the SEC, when you look at the hire and the ability to make a controversial hire in Lane Kiffin, and we all all remember what a pain the end of last season was, but we also remember what 2020 was. We also remember what 2021 was, and we also are expecting big things in 2023 going into the college football playoff in 2024. If we can get everything together and do what we need to do, we should be in position to get into that tournament the first year it expands. Absolutely monumental moment for the football program. And when you say that, it's a monumental moment for Keith Carter. Baseball coach, let me tell you over and over, the heat coming from people to fire Mike Bianco for four years has been hard, but Keith Carter has stood beside him. And Ole Miss is a national champion college baseball program because Keith Carter did that. It's not all about hiring. That's what people need to realize. It's not all about hiring. Sometimes you need to know when not to do something. Like when Coach O was struggling the first couple of years, he stood by her. And she, he is being rewarded right now by a program that's on the ascendancy. Like I said, we talked in the first segment about how Ole Miss ranks in the big three. You can honestly add women's basketball to that too. Because what Coach Yo has done is absolutely phenomenal. Absolutely amazing. So, it's important that Ole Miss keeps growing and keeps this ascendancy. And Keith Carter at the head of this ship, I am honestly, I have no doubts whatsoever. I have no doubts about Keith Carter's ability to make decisions that will honestly impact Ole Miss fans positively. Now, I'm not saying he's not going to make a mistake. I'm not saying he's going to do it. But he's going to do things that's in the best interest of the fan base. And I think that's what he does that other athletic directors stumble on. Keith Carter making decisions based on the fan base. We did a video, what was it, two weeks ago about the coming storm that Keith Carter and Ole Miss Athletics was about to face about Chris Beard. This was long before any traction was made. It was just the fact that he was out there and the fact that it was going to become a big story. And I noticed around the fan base this upswell of information and this upswell 
of almost campaigning for a coach. It got to the point really, really quickly that even somebody as good as Dusty May would not fit at Ole Miss. Whoever got the job that was not named Chris Beard was going to have an impossible task. I sensed that very, very early on. I think Keith Carter did as well. And Keith Carter, you know, whenever he takes, he makes a risky hire or he does things that other ADs might not do, that doesn't mean he's not vetting. I, my understanding is Chris Beard was one of the most vetted candidates almost in the history of candidates. Ole Miss went into this because they had to because of the fan base, because they needed to find that red flag, that smoking gun that said, hey, we can't hire this guy because of this, because of their fan base. So they vetted him, and they vetted him, and they had all kinds of people doing background checks and neighbors, and they were questioning everything. Honestly, it would have been similar to the way the federal government does with a Yankee white clearance. Clearance. They hit everybody. They branches of trees over and over. And that red flag and that smoking gun never came. So that's when Chris Beard became a legit candidate for the Ole Miss job. It wasn't before then. It would, this isn't a case of Ole Miss rushing into a situation. This is a case of Ole Miss getting all the facts out, knowing what's going on. People that were neighbors with Chris Beard whenever he was the coach of Little Rock. They did all of that stuff. Alumni coming in. They even talked to athletic directors at his previous stops. This candidate was massively vetted. It's one of the reasons I'm fairly confident with coming on here with the shows that I've had over the last couple of weeks. If there was any red flags that popped up that said, hey, we should not do this, it would have popped up. Keith Carter being willing to do that is another reason he's got a roster of coaches in the big three, honestly the big four, that's second to none. Yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing. And I all the kudos in the world go out to Keith Carter. And also, all the kudos in the world go out to Glenn Boyce. You're not going to hear this from everybody because a few years ago when Glenn Boyce was selected, there was almost a campaign against him, potentially because he was not somebody that was chosen by that cabal that's sitting around Oxford, that's sitting around Memphis, that group of 20 people that like to be important and need to be important and they need to call the shots on things like that. When Glenn Boyce, you remember whenever he got hired, there was a pushback. There was a major thing. Heck, I didn't think they did podcast on it. It, it. It's weird. It's bizarre. But Glenn Boyce and Keith Carter working together, Glenn Boyce is in a place where athletics, you can tell it's important to him. Keith Carter's in a point where he's trying to do the best for the Ole Miss fan base. And as a benefit, enrollment is going up at Ole Miss. Might be going down elsewhere in the state. It's going up at Ole Miss. And it's going to continue to go up. Because now you have a 2023 season that is massive for maximizing going into the 12-team playoff. Texas and Oklahoma coming in in 2024. Massive season. There's no way around it. You've got a basketball coach that is going to instill hope starting in November. And this gap that we had essentially was recruiting in January, nothing happening in February, and then the Chris Beard stuff in March. But, you know, that period of time where nothing was really going on and Ole Miss fans could detach, that's not going to be an option next year. Next year's basketball season will be must-see TV. Women's basketball taking the next step, must-see TV. And that leads into a national championship level baseball program, spring football. And you have an academic year that is going to be chock full of sports. And that is because of what Keith Carter has done. I think he is the goat of ADs. And I think it's at the point where Ole Miss needs to worry about keeping him. 
he is going to get a reputation and people are going to try and hire him away. Understand that. Make preparations. Do what you need to do. But that is absolutely coming down the road. What is happening right now, the reputation that Danny White got way back when, I I guess at um, UCF, other schools are going to start to notice that as well. When we come up, Come back. We have Derek Vandegrift giving a preview on weekend baseball with the Vanderbilt Commodores as he's, SEC play starts. I think Derek's going to get a little analytical as well. It should be pretty cool. Anyway, stick around. All right, thanks for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast, including YouTube. So do us a favor, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell for notifications, upvote the video, and participate in the conversation for the month of February, we are sixth in the Locked On College Network on YouTube. So our YouTube channel is doing very well. They like us very much. They always send me graphics and things like that. Um, I do appreciate that. Anyway, this came in after I recorded the first two segments, but I figured you guys needed to know Brian Berg has been hired by Ole Miss as an assistant coach to Chris Beard. Um, He coached with him at Little Rock and Texas Tech before going to Georgia Southern. Um, So we'll see exactly how that goes. And the rumor is yesterday, Al Pinkins was on campus. Um, A a friend of mine has direct knowledge of that and has seen exactly how that is. So um, I I think Al Pinkins and Brian Berg, that's like the leaders in the clubhouse to be assistants, but we'll see how it stands for with win case and how that goes as well. Anyway, I'm here with Derek Vandy Griff. We're going to do our weekend preview about the Vanderbilt Commodores. How you doing, Derek? Doing good, man. How about you? Man, I'm doing pretty fantastic, honestly. Um, there's a story out of the World Baseball Classic, and I, I just it's not Ole Miss related at all, but it's just kind of a cool story. But there's a Nicaraguan pitcher. He's not a professional. He's not listed on any North American professional league. But he made the Nicaraguan national baseball team. He went in, his name is Duque Hebert, I think. I'm probably butchering the pronunciation, but it's there. He came into the ninth inning, and in I think it was a 6-1 to Dominican leading game. So it was just basically garbage time. Get the kid a moment, you know, send him out there yeah. to pitch. He proceeded to strike out Juan Soto, Julio Rodriguez, and Rafael Devers back-to-back-to-back in the ninth inning and walked out of that stadium that night with a contract from the Detroit Tigers. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty impressive. Did you say this happened yesterday? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tie Ole Miss into it then real quick because Lance Lynn pitched for Team USA yesterday, so there's our World Baseball Classic, how we can kind of tie this all together a little bit, right? Even though yep. that's not who he played, but still. Uh, but, yeah, that's incredibly impressive for somebody that hasn't pitched in the major leagues before. Those are – Obviously, three world-class hitters, three of the better hitters in the major leagues. Uh, and I am i know two of them are lefties. I think maybe all three are lefts. Can't remember if Julio Rodriguez is lefty or not, but I know Soto and Devers both are. Uh, and he's a right-hander, if I'm not mistaken. So, yeah, that's incredibly impressive. <laughs> yeah, and it's a chance to where um, one of his first stops, a ball, is 15 minutes up the road. So, there's a chance I might actually be able to go see this guy pitch. Um, so I'm looking forward to that this yeah, summer yeah, to see yeah, how it goes. Actually, yeah, yeah, you've got to get up there and see that, man. Anybody can strike those guys out back to back to back. He's uh, He's got to have a pretty special pitch in his repertoire somewhere that uh, folks just aren't picking up would be my guess. Yeah, he's got, he's got some stuff. He's got some stuff. Anyway, two Ole Miss, two the weekend series with the Vanderbilt Commodores, the number three Ole Miss Rebels, defending national champions, because we have to get that in right. at the beginning. Yep, uh, plays the the week. number six Vanderbilt Commodores. I play, I think that's at Hawkinsfield in Nashville, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Um, this is going to be probably the biggest game of the weekend, not for Ole Miss, just in college baseball period, because this is a three versus six series. Um, Jack Doherty is probably going to take the hill to start off. Tell me a little bit about Vanderbilt. Bring me up to speed on the Commodores. Uh, yeah, you know, uh, obviously a really good baseball team. They're not ranked six in the country for nothing, right? Uh, but they're a team that kind of struggles hitting the ball a little bit, which is kind of weird. You know, you, of course, you always think about um, pitching. Of course, they've got the pitching. You know, there's always going to be guys that you see pitch for Vanderbilt in the SEC tournament that have logged three and four innings all year. 
uh, that come in and throw 97, 98 miles an hour out of nowhere, and you just think, man, where did this guy come from? Uh, so they're always loaded with pitching, but they, they, they usually hit it really well. And it's a little different this year because they're really not. Uh, they have one everyday player hitting over 300 on the entire team. Uh, obviously, guys that don't play near as much don't get as many at-bats. There's a couple of them over 300. But the Duke transfer playing right field, R.J. Shrek, he's the only guy hitting over 300 for him. He's hitting 317, leads the team in average, home runs, doubles, triples, uh, he's kind of doing it all for him right now. Uh, obviously, he doesn't lead the team in RBIs because nobody else gets on base for him, uh, uh, apparently up there in Nashville. So, uh, but, but, yeah, he's swinging it real well. Uh, kind of digging into this team, one thing that really caught my eye, uh, everybody knows about Enrique Bradfield Jr., right, the, the great leadoff hitter and center fielder for Vanderbilt. If nobody's ever watched him play, you've got to tune in Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and see this guy play. He's absolutely uh, – a treat to watch run down balls in the outfield. And if he ever gets on base, he is an absolute menace on the base paths. But he's really struggling this year, only hitting 239. Uh, he's actually been caught stealing three times already this year after being caught, I think, either six or seven times in his entire career at Vanderbilt the last two seasons. He's uh, stolen 93 bases with seven caught stealings the last two seasons going into this year. He's a guy that can absolutely – uh, raise hell on the base paths, you know, if you let him on. But but he's not able to get on base for whatever reason this year. So I started doing a little bit of digging on him, kind of figure out what's going on with him because he's got such a good skill set uh, that, that has been cons as consistent as he's been so far in his career really struggling like this. There had to be a reason for it. Uh, so I started digging into a little bit of some analytics a little bit, see what's going on with him. His his bat, bat bip uh, is, is way down this year. Uh, it's at 254, I think it is, going into this weekend. Uh, so I started doing a little bit more digging, trying to figure out what the reasoning is for that. Uh, his ground ball rate is pretty much on par for where it's been the last couple years. And a lot of times, for people that don't know a lot about analytics, your big power hitters and stuff like that, you want them to have a really, really low ground ball rate, right? Because there are usually some really big guys you want them to hit it out of the ballpark. Uh, that's not Bradfield's game. Uh, he's a speedster, obviously. You want him to hit it on the ground, and you want him to hit line drives. You want him to keep the ball out of the air. Line drives are fine. That's not a big deal. That's where you're making the optimal contact, splitting gaps, stuff like that, uh, and not giving the outfielders a chance to get underneath the ball. Well, one thing that's killing him so far this year, his line drive rate the past two years has been 16.5% and 16.6%. That's all the way down to 7.1% this year for him. So he, he, he's not making that optimal contact. He's not driving the ball into the gaps like he had been doing the past couple of years. And his fly ball rate was 34.5% and 30.5%. And that's all the way up to 393 so far this year. So a big jump in fly ball rate, big decrease in line drive rate, even though he's got the same ground ball rate. I think that's why you're seeing the big discrepancies in the BABIP which is ultimately killing his batting average right now and, and not allowing him to get on base the way he's usually able to do. Uh, you know, last year he hit 317, year before that 335. And like I said, he's down almost 100 points from his freshman year right now down to 239 this year. But make no mistake, it's a guy that can absolutely kill you if you mess around with him. Walking, for example, right? We've talked about walk so much this year for this Ole Miss pitching staff throw the ball in the strike zone. If he's going to hit pop flies and fly balls for you, you take it because we've got the outfielders out there that can run these balls down. Don't walk this guy because if he does, a walk can turn into a triple in a hurry with him. He's he's that good on the base paths. He's that fast. He's that, that athletic. And uh, as much as we hit the ball to try our damnedest, keep it out of center field because there's nothing in there that he can't run down. Just a really, really good player for anybody that hasn't seen him yet. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of surprising that he's struggling a little bit this year, but Vanderbilt being sixth in the country with that team struggling offensively the way they are, they must pitch the heck out of it. Yeah, 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 they do. Uh, kind of a little nightmare flashback for Ole Miss fans right now. If you remember the name Carter Holton, right, the guy that started that Tuesday in Hoover when Ole Miss thought we had to have that win against Vanderbilt opening the SEC tournament to get in to a regional last year, right? And, uh, you know, he was that freshman lefty. You know, that, not the one that had only pitched a few innings all year. He, he did pitch a good bit. Uh, 
started a lot of midweek and a lot in the like Saturday, some Saturday, uh, Sunday roll for him. They just kind of used him where they needed him at. And he's a guy with a really, really live fastball. And he come in, he shut Ole Miss down last year. And that Tuesday in Hoover, uh, he's the ace of the staff. He's going to start Thursday for us here. You know, he's the Friday night starter, but he's the Thursday starter, sophomore lefty, 221 ERA. Uh, quite frankly, I think he's been a little bit lucky, though. Uh, I think Ole Miss can get after him. He's got a 90% strand rate so far this year, which is incredibly high. Uh, he's got a 113 whip, so he's allowing runners to get on base every inning. The problem is the hitters at the plate aren't taking advantage of it and driving those guys in. You don't see a strand rate as high as 90% like he's done so far this year. That's eventually going to come up. It's going to bite you. And hopefully it bites him this Thursday night when the Rebels come into town because he's going to face an offense that's absolutely relentless. It ain't going to chase pitches. That's one thing we've been so good at when you go back and look what we've done so far this year. We we don't go outside the zone or outside our comfort zone. Um, you know, if we get a favorable, just say 3-1 count, for example, we're looking for one pitch in one area. If we don't get it, we spit on it, go to a 3-2 count, and then we open up our zone and protect it top to bottom, east to west, and then, you know, we, we attack it from there. Um, but but we don't go outside of the zone very much, and that's one thing that's really helped this offense be so deep top to bottom all year long. So that's one thing he's going to have to navigate. If he allows base runners, then this is the kind of team that can really get to him and, and, and finally kind of hammer that strand rate down a little bit because it's absurdly high right now. Yeah, and, and this is the game that I'm thankful for the Purdue series and the timely hitting that Ole Miss had to do to get that sweep, that extra inning with win. Um, coming yeah. through late in the game on Sunday, that is actually going to help them because timely hitting is going to be more important. It's going to be more honestly demanded now that SEC play has started. And you've got like Vandy and then Florida and then Arkansas. It, 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 is, it is stupidly hard. Yeah. A&M, LSU, Mississippi yeah. State, Georgia, I mean, it just doesn't end, you know. It's uh, in, in an incredibly difficult schedule, uh, but that's one thing that Mike Bianco and the crew did going into this year is they made sure that they scheduled teams to get us ready for this, right? You know, uh, Nebraska's a really good team. You know, they're, they, they're one of the top five teams in the Big Ten. It's, it's, as a matter of fact, it's a team that beat this Vanderbilt team up in Minnesota when we had that tournament up there. Um, Nebraska ended up getting getting on Carter Holton a little bit and ended up beating him that night. So, uh, yeah, this is a battle-tested team. Uh, we, we didn't just sit here and play cupcakes all the way through. You know, we I know we had Delaware there to open, open the weekend, but then you talk about four games against Maryland, getting Nebraska, uh, already played Southern Miss in a midweek. You know, this, this isn't a team that's just – had nothing but cupcakes so far this year and just kind of walked through it. You know, we've, we've earned everything we've got. They're battle-tested. They've seen some really good pitchers. Uh, Savical from Maryland, obviously. I know we've talked about him twice already on this podcast this year, but that's, uh, I mean, that's an SEC-level arm. He could step in for any SEC team and, you know, step right into, at the very least, a Saturday role for any one of them. He's that good. And we faced him twice already, you know, and finished one and one against him, really beat him up that last time. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's a schedule that uh, I think was put together really well to kind of lead up to what we're going to face in this early SEC slate because these next six weeks are just absolute bears for us. Yeah, and you know, to change the subject just a little bit and going back to that Purdue series, have you what what is the highest exit velocity you have seen? 118 has to be up there, right? Man, I'd, I'd have to go back and look. I – I'm pretty sure Kemp topped 120 last year. There was one ball he hit over uh, the left field playground and everything else went out into the parking lot that I feel went like 121, 122, something like that. It was absolutely insane, which that guy, everything he touches, I mean, he could swing without a bat and just hit it with the palm of his hand and it's going to go 105, I think. Well, the funny thing is with Kemp is he it's not like a cricket paddle he's hitting with. It, he's not hitting oh, with no. a flight. So he is squaring up a round bat with a round ball, which that's, right. that's unbelievably impressive. And these are yeah. these are Division One arms coming in, and he's hitting the no. ball that hard. 
I mean, it's un- unbelievable, honestly. Yeah. 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 And it's also really, really impressive the way they do it, too. I mean, I'll, I'll jump over to Calvin Harris for a second, too. But, you know, you go back to the walk off Kemp hit. Obviously, it was opposite field. But how many hits do you see Calvin Harris go to the opposite field, too, right? They're, they're able to stay on any pitch as long as they need to and react and still barrel it up. That's what's so impressive. You know, if you sit there and sell out and try to guess for, uh, fastball in or third or uh you know a change up low and away something like that and you end up getting it then you just guess right then yeah you can barrel it up but you can tell they're up there identifying the pitch coming out of a hand identifying a location and still getting a barrel on the way they are it's incredibly impressive and we do it top to bottom you know uh mm-hmm. Groff does it a lot you know he's he's been incredible for us Calvin Harris, TJ McCants has really come into his own. That kid is absolutely crushing the ball. That's that's the one guy I'm so happy for on this team, the way he's playing right now. He's hitting everything inside. And, uh, you know, Purdue guy, He uh, the the coach got a little scared of Kemp on Sunday, so he sat there and walked him four times. Don't he got the Barry Bonds there treatment, yeah. Yeah, there ain't no chance I'd have thrown him a pitch mm-hmm. either. But then you turn around, you still got to deal with Calarco, McCants, and those guys in behind him, you know. And, I mean, that's what makes this team so special. Uh, I, I was talking to a guy earlier today, and he asked me, do I think that this offense is better than last year's? And I never hesitated. Yes. Yes, th- this offense is better than last year's because of how deep it is. Like, that's what's incredible. One through nine, if you try to take a break, if you try to pitch around a guy, something like that, the guy right behind him is going to pick him up, and he's going to drive him in, and he's going to make you pay. Um, and – we truly have that one through nine right now. I mean, look at Leger, you know, batting in the nine hole for us the day he had Sunday, right? You know, he kind of struggled a little bit with the bats, been really good with the glove. You know, that's kind of my worry coming into the year. Uh, but but he come up with some big hits for Sunday, and then he, he's down in the nine hole. And Chatney was down in the nine hole earlier in the year, and he's hit so good. He's moved up to sixth and seventh. And, uh, but, but right now the guys down at the bottom part of the lineup are swinging so good it's hard to keep them there. But now you're having trouble fi- figuring out where you can move them up to. Uh, it's it's a lot of fun to watch. Uh, these these guys, they're just absolutely relentless, one through nine. And I, I'm not sure I've seen an offense this deep, and that's what makes them so fun. Um, the pitching uh, for, for Ole Miss right now, uh, you know, we've got Jordan Vera pitching against Jacksonville State. So that tells you that there's a bigger role coming for J.T. Quinn, right? You saw him come in in big moments this past weekend against Purdue and, you know, kind of started thinking in the back of my head, you know, this is probably something you're going to see a little bit more just because of the lack of arms without Elliott and Maddox right now. And once I saw that the era was starting on Tuesday night, that was the first thing I thought of. I was like, all right, well, Quinn's about to get that expanded role into the weekend now. And, and quite frankly, it's an arm we really need. I'm happy to see it. And hopefully Bear can hold down the midweeks from here on out and JT can take on the, bigger role out of the bullpen yeah that's a nice promotion for jt um going in there and i imagine they want they have an idea with a certain pitcher they want to pair him with as the long reliever that for two or three innings so it'll be interesting to see exactly how that goes my guess is rivas i'm not sure about that um i think he would pair pretty well with um rivas i'm I'm thinking maybe Sonier just because you're not getting a lot of length out of him right now. Like Doherty, you're at least getting that five innings. Then Reva showed you this past Sunday he could give you six. Uh, so so you're not having to bridge as much to get to Mason Nichols one way or another. Sonier's been so shaky with those really bad one or two innings per start. Really running up that pitch count would be nice to get JT in there to be able to spell him if we're able to. All right, thank you for making the Locked On Ole Miss podcast your first listen every day. Make sure you check out our brand new podcast, Locked On College Baseball. Everything you need to know about college basketball in one place. I said college baseball, I meant basketball. Plus, you get to hear from big-name experts, insiders, coaches, and players. Locked On College Basketball, available on YouTube and wherever you get your podcast. Derek, thank you very much for stopping by today. Everybody that's watching the show, join our subtext community. It's online. The link is in the description. Um, I, I'm, I, we're trying to figure out exactly how we want to do it, but it's a way for you to get your time back and still follow Ole Miss um, sports at the fullest. But for Derek, I'm Steve, man. Thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Hotty toddy. All right.